Let me go ahead and uh, introduce uh, our panel for today and uh, go from there. So uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to our uh, <clears throat> discussion of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is a virtual panel discussion hosted by the Department of Political Science and the School of Education Behavioral Sciences here at Middle Georgia State, um, also co-sponsored by uh, the uh, MGA uh, Political Science Student Organization uh, and the uh, Alpha Mu Zeta chapter of Pi Sigma Alpha, which is the National Honorary Society for Political Science. Um, so first, uh, what we'll do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, the uh, department and then uh, introduce our panelists and talk about the uh, structure of the event and uh, go from there. So. Um, so we have several different programs that are offered by our department. For those of you that are unfamiliar with us, uh, we have um, a bachelor of science degree in political science, as well as bachelor of science degree in interdisciplinary studies. Uh, we also offer minors in uh, political science, African and African diaspora studies, uh, environmental policy studies, global studies and pre-law, and a certificate in European Union studies as well, for those of you that are not familiar with us. so. Um, as far as our panelists go, I'd like to welcome uh, first uh, Dr. John Hall, who is an associate professor of political science and has been here at Middle Georgia State since 2015. His doctorate is uh, in political science from Auburn University. Uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Thomas Matchock, who is an instructor of political science here at Middle Georgia State. Uh, he has been with us uh, since uh, 2020, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, and is a former professor at Air University, UNC Greensboro, and Army War College, and is the executive director of the Joint Civil Military Interaction Network. Uh, his doctorate is in, uh, I believe, a conflict resolution management uh, from uh, Nova Southeastern University. And uh, last but not least, um, I'm your moderator, Dr. Christopher Lawrence. I'm an associate professor of political science and chair of the department. I've been here since 2012, and my doctorate in political science is from the University of Mississippi. I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Matthew Caverly for joining us this evening, and uh, certainly he's welcome to uh, share any thoughts he has on our questions as we move forward as well. Um, and I'd like to thank our attendees. We are a little low on attendance so far. Hopefully a few more people will be drifting in here um, in a little bit, because certainly I believe this should be some pretty interesting uh, material. Um, <clears throat> So uh, um, for those of you that have not joined us for one of these events before, uh, the format is fairly straightforward. Uh, I have uh, pre-selected uh, into consultation with the uh, panelists uh, a few uh, potential questions to ask, um, and we'll start with those. Um, and then uh, we also, though, are interested in your questions as well, um, which you can ask in the chat window. Um, which I will uh, try to intersperse with our uh, discussion questions as well. And um, please be courteous and civil to each other in the chat window. Um, usually we don't have any trouble with that, so I'm, I'm not uh, too worried about that. So um, let me uh, move forward and just uh, tell you briefly kind of an overview of what questions uh, I anticipate we'll probably be asking. Uh, so I have some, have some questions about the historical background of the conflict. Uh, current developments, we had a discussion event about the uh, conflict in Ukraine about, I believe it was seven months ago or so, so it was six, seven months ago, so obviously a lot of developments since then. Um, uh, potential for, you know, how this uh, conflict gets resolved, um, an exit strategy or off-ramp or whatever you want might want to call that, um, and then uh, also, uh, you know, how uh, Ukraine support has been uh, evolving with regards to the European Union, uh, the United States, other allies as well. Um, so let me uh, get rid of the uh, slides here for now. And uh, so you can see our panelists uh, more uh, more clearly. Um, and uh, Without further ado, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, start with our uh, first question if everybody's uh, ready for that. So great. Um, so our first question um, is just a bit of background really about the conflict, um, specifically what historical links are there between Russia and Ukraine and um, 
how does that sort of play into the conflict as it's uh, played out over the last, well, um, depending on how you're counting, either um, eight years or eight months? Dr. Simon, I didn't know if you wanted to take that first. So I want to yield to your expertise in foreign policy. Yeah, yeah, yes, you're 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 too kind. Um, yeah, it, this is an interesting one, especially when we say, okay, let's 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 put a, a mark on the wall and say, when did this um, when did this uh, this conflict e uh, emerge? And so certainly we could look at um, at February of this year and say, well, that's when the conflict began. We can talk about the the following uh, eight or nine months, where however that, that uh, comes out. One of the things I, I would uh, say is when I think about this and when I think about uh, this ongoing conflict, my my start date for this conflict um, is 1919. Um, and it, it, it started with um, uh, the establishment of the of the uh, the Soviet Union Bolshevik, Bolshevik Resolu uh, Revolution. And what Putin perceived to be uh, Lenin's um, betrayal by establishing uh, uh, Ukraine, a country that never existed. And we hear that same narrative uh, today uh, when Putin says uh, Ukraine is not a real country. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a colony uh, at best of, of Russia. So uh, in thinking in that 200 year present, I, I would um, put my start point for this conflict at, uh, at 1919 and what, and, and using, and it, this would be Putin's own um, in statement that he, that he really believes that it was Lenin that uh, that uh, kicked this can over and caused this this ongoing problem. Um, of course, we could always go back to to Catherine the Great, who who uh, first annexed Crimea, <laughs> um, and and so th there there's been a long historical connection in this region long before there were countries, long before 1648 and Westphalia and sovereign states and all. So this has been been a pretty much a, a, a conflicted region for a, a good long while. Now that brings us up to uh to February of of this of, of this year. I, I I found it interesting that uh, during closed door uh, briefings to congressional leaders on February 2nd and 3rd, uh, General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, stated that Kiev would fall within 72 hours with a cost of 15,000 uh, Ukrainian troop deaths. Um, in April 5th, Milley testified, I do think this is a very protracted conflict and I think it's at least measured in years. Um, and uh, NATO, U.S. allies, partners in Ukraine are going to be involved in this for quite some time. So I, I, I bring this up to, to demonstrate that we never even had a good understanding of the situation from the start. And we've been playing catch up, running around, trying to make sense of all this. So what, what's the history then of the conflict? It's one of catch up. Uh, from our perspective, um, in that we have not taken seriously uh, uh, since uh, Putin's Munich uh, speech uh, to his June uh, 21 speech, where he said that Ukraine is Russia and there is no Russia without Ukraine, and that he would be all in on this conflict uh, because the, 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 the uh, alternative is not acceptable, no Russia. Um, so that, that, that's the, uh, a little bit of the, of the historical piece of it that I find um, is absolutely fascinating. If we start at 1919, uh, look at that, uh, what is perceived as a betrayal, and as Putin said, the, uh, the worst, the, the fall of the Soviet Union being the, the worst event of the 20th century, um, and then coming into uh, Maidan in, um, in 2014, and the annexation of Crimea and the occupation of Eastern Ukraine, we see just one long continuous fight. And this is simply one manifestation of that long fight. 
that's been that's been uh, ongoing and arguably we could we could really go back to Catherine the Great. We could go back to Ukraine's uh, connection to Lithuania and Poland. Uh, uh, we could go back to the 1300s uh, to to look at the the historical root of uh, of what we're seeing today. So I hope that was not too long winded to uh, to talk about the history of this uh, of this conflict. Those are great points. Uh, just again, I like you said, Tom, to to ask the question, when does the Russian Ukrainian issue begin? You could measure that in millennia. You could measure that in decades. Um, you made great points. I would actually start in 1991. I, I would go to the fall of the Soviet Union and we have the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, President Vladimir Putin um, was there. He saw that. He, like you said, he referred to that as the single worst thing to happen in the 20th century. And if anyone, any of our students who have joined us, and thank you all for taking part, um, if anyone's familiar with the 20th century, to call the breakup of the Soviet Union the worst thing that happened is to ignore quite a few horrible things. This gives us an image of what Vladimir Putin wants, his policies. Uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, you have a lot of what was once Eastern Europe in the Soviet Union, um, breaking off into independence movements, creating uh, liberal democracies, and the Russians were losing that buffer that they preferred to have. Uh, also, if you're familiar with the 20th century, the 19th century, you know why Russia wants to have a buffer between it and the rest of Europe, particularly uh, Germany in the 20th century, France in the, eight, uh, the 19th century, and they were losing that. Um, so with the breakup of the Soviet Union, you have the seed being planted in President Putin's head that this is the collapse of something great, and he wants to bring that back. Uh, in the 90s, especially in the 21st century, uh, you see democratic elections uh, putting in to the presidency pro-Russian and pro-Western candidates. Um, this eventually comes to a head uh, with the invasion of the, the Crimean Peninsula or the annexation of it and the eventual uh, invasion of Ukraine proper. Again, great job, Tom. Uh, I'm just trying to add a few more details there. The history between the Russians and the Ukrainians is quite extensive. The number one thing to keep in mind for any of our students who aren't, who aren't that familiar is the view of Putin and many Russians that Ukraine is part of Russia. They have the same view of Belarus. Uh, so there is this belief that Ukraine is in fact artificial, that it belongs to Russia and the Russians are using military force uh, to try to guarantee that. So we can probably circle back around to this later, but that's a great introduction. Yeah. Yeah, th 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 thanks so much. And as you're saying that, John, I just want to add in it, because, as you as you mentioned, um, uh, you know, Ukraine and there's no Russia without Ukraine, and and um, how long is it? It's it's interesting too that 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 Ukraine was established first historically. So mm -hmm. there was a, a Ukraine before there was a, a Russia, um, and that the the Rus come from Ukraine and the Muscova come from uh, Russia. Uh, so it, it's a, it's an interesting historical twist that when we look at where the Rus uh, come from, mm -hmm. vice the, the the Moskva. Yeah, great great points, John. Thank you for. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, as uh, Dr. Hall uh, pleased with his uh, lights there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's see. So, um, <clears throat> kind of more specifically, kind of getting to the geopolitics here. Um, why do why do you think that Russia wants to control at least the eastern and southern parts of modern Ukraine, if not all of Ukraine, uh, you know, such as the Crimean Peninsula and the so-called Donbass region? What what's in it for for Russia in controlling those areas? Is it just about being a buffer area? Is there something more to that? Great question. I'll jump on. Um, there are several reasons, uh, geopolitical reasons for the Russians wanting to have access at least to the far eastern portion of Ukraine. On the one hand, money. Uh, it is a heavily industrialized region in Ukraine. Uh, there are extraordinary amounts of coal uh, that are present there. So you can ask the same question of any nation state. Why would you want a region that's heavily industrialized and has a lot of coal uh, because of the resources that are there? In addition, there are some geographic uh, reasons for wanting to control at least the eastern portion. And that is that it connects Russia. It creates this land bridge to the Crimean Peninsula that they seized uh, back in 2014. Uh, so if you seize the Crimean Peninsula, it makes sense that you would want to have a land bridge to connect. Also, there are 
relatively simple political reasons. There are a number or a higher number of pro-Russian uh, civilian populations in the eastern Donbass region. That is important to say, but it's also important to note that when polled, uh, vast majorities of Ukrainians uh, do not have positive images of Moscow, even when you look at the Donbass region. So to simply claim that there are a lot of ethnic Russians, Russian speakers in that area, if this were 20 years ago, that would be an interesting argument. But today, there are so many bilingual people in the eastern portion of Ukraine uh, that that doesn't really add up. So why would Russia want at least this eastern portion that they somewhat seized, although they're losing a great deal of it today? Those reasons. It's wealth. There, there's a great deal of wealth there. It's a land bridge to the Crimean Peninsula. In addition, from the perspective of national pride, Russia started a fight that in many ways you could look at as Russia has been losing that fight from very early on. Uh, so if for no other reason, maintaining control of areas that they have controlled in the past is another major reason that the Putin administration would want to keep what they have seized. Uh, when we speak later about possible exit strategies, that might be one of them, allowing the Russians to keep the areas in the Donetsk and the Luhansk that they have seized already, although they are losing ground significantly. So I will leave it at that and turn it over to Tom for reasons why Russia would want to at least maintain control of the eastern portions of Ukraine, mainly because they have them now. Yeah, no, I echo every, everything you uh, you you pointed out, John. And I'll, I'll just add, if if I could, I you know when I was looking at this question that uh, 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 you know that uh, Chris had, had sent along, uh, again for for and, and to understand Putin, and this this is this is getting into, into Putin's mind. Uh, one of the things we we realize or, or should realize is that um, for Putin, history matters. And uh, uh, Crimea is incredibly important uh, to uh, to uh, Russia, uh, as I mentioned with with Catherine the Great's first annexation of it in 1783. And th this the this history is well known to uh, to Russians and certainly to uh, to Putin. And uh, that that and this too um, was was the beginning, the birth of the Russian Empire. Uh, and, and when when uh, Sweden's Charles the the twelfth was defeated by the by the Cossacks, and so th this specific you know why this piece you know there's the, the there's the geopolitical piece, and then there's the the historical cultural piece uh, that's so so significant, and this all contributes back to this point about why there's no Russia without without uh, Ukraine. So uh, for for Putin, history matters. And one of the things he wants to do is to rewrite the history of Ukraine and Europe. And to do that, he has to he has to have uh, territory, possess territory. Um, and I had already mentioned about uh, you know Lenin uh, uh, losing Ukraine in uh, in 1922 with the formation of the the Soviet uh, Soviet Union. But to be even more specific, to drill down even more specific, and to add to the point you made, John, one of the things that um, uh, that Crimea in eastern uh, the eastern portions of, of Ukraine offer to Russia is uh, uh, a warm a warm water port and control of the Black Sea and to allow its Black Sea um, uh, fleet access to uh, the Mediterranean and uh, into North Africa, the Middle East, and we see that in Syria because if we remember the events that occurred. It was it was the annexation of Crimea, which freed up uh, the Black Sea uh, Black Sea Fleet of, the, of of Russia, which then allowed it access to Syria, and we, and we recall that uh, uh, Russia had been pushed out of the Middle East, and it had it had no it had no presence in the Middle East whatsoever, but now it's able to move its forces into Syria to support uh, uh, Assad, and. Now re put that that foothold back into the Middle East. So we now have a Russia uh, back in the Middle East, access to the Mediterranean, control of uh, the, the the Black Sea, as well as allowing for the weaponization of food and landlocking Ukraine. So uh, why the eastern portion? Uh, yes, absolutely. Industrial base that was also always the industrial heartland of Ukraine. It also, uh, uh, for security purposes, 
and and also, as you said, uh, the bridge that would move from Russia proper uh, to Crimea. And I would also then add to that, uh, strategically, it landlocks Ukraine, weaponizes uh, uh, grain, access to the Mediterranean, and allows for all kinds of troublemaking. Uh, now, as Russia seeks to reestablish itself as an empire, and this is Putin's language, that that uh, Russia needs to 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 reestablish itself as an empire, but you you can't be an empire unless you can project power, and and this allows him to project that power outward. So, I hope that adds to it. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so, given um uh, what you said before, um. You know where where do we stand with the conflict at the moment? Obviously, things have uh, developed uh, quite a bit since our last discussion, and I think it was late February, early early March. Um, and uh, how much have cha have things changed since Russia really posted some early gains in the war, uh, particularly in the east and to some extent even in the north? Uh, obviously, um, you know a lot of that has has changed. So how has that changed? What what and what what is the trend if there is a trend in the in the conflict? Great question. I'll jump on this one. Um, to summarize, uh, a great deal has occurred in the last month and a half, and that is basically in the form of a counteroffensive by the Ukrainians. To summarize the entire war, um, what we once thought was a conventional military superpower literally crosses over its border and proves that it is incapable of subjugating the nation state of Ukraine. I will address the reasons for Putin's um, mistakes later. But from the outset, the Ukrainians have shown themselves to be overwhelmingly more capable militarily than Russia or the United States thought they would be. As the Russians change their strategies and pull out and seem to abandon any attempts at taking the capital city of Kyiv, they refocus their efforts in the east for reasons that we've discussed. There is the most, the, the highest level of support for Russia is going to be found in the eastern Donbass region. So they refocused their efforts there and had some degree of success. But the counteroffensive as of late has taken back extraordinary amounts of land uh, in the east, getting into the Donbass, actually threatening uh, to get closer to uh, Crimea, looking at the southern port city, uh, the southern city of Kershon. The Ukrainians have had extraordinary success in this counteroffensive, so much so, in fact, that Vladimir Putin requested uh, a call up of over 300,000 Russian reserves. That is a sign that the Ukrainians are fighting the Russians in a way that Putin had absolutely no comprehension of. In response, in addition to the call up of 300,000 plus soldiers, which has not proved successful so far, the Russians have recently started a strategy that can best be referred to as terrorism, um, shooting uh, missiles, guided missiles into uh, Ukrainian cities, most recently uh, in the last 24 hours, uh, using unguided suicide drones, sending those into urban areas. The Russian strategy uh, utilizing these terroristic tactics is showing us again how much less effective the Russian military is conventionally than we thought it was. So the most recent updates have been extraordinary success on the part of the Ukrainians and Russian tactics that are starting to suggest that they do not have the military capability of subjugating uh, Ukraine. One thing we can look at is the use of S-300 anti-aircraft missile systems. If you're familiar with any military technology, when it comes to anti-aircraft weapon systems, the Russians are phenomenal. Uh, they have a giant geographic area. The need for any aircraft weapon systems is grand. And the Russians are using old anti aircraft weapon systems to strike civilian targets in Ukraine. That lets us know basically one thing why would you use an anti aircraft weapon system to attack cities that might insinuate that you are running low on precision guided missile systems? The US and European slash global sanctions against Russia after the invasion of Ukraine may be showing itself to be effective. If Russia is running out of expensive, sophisticated uh, weapon systems, it might be because they simply cannot build any more. The sanctions may be having an effect. So most recent changes, again, just to summarize and find a spot to stop talking, because it's very difficult for me to do that. 
the Ukrainians are doing quite well. The counteroffensive is beyond impressive. And Russia, as a conventionary military force, appears uh, to be as, I'm going to say, incompetent as they have proved to be so far. On that note, I will stop. Yeah, absolutely, John. There, there, there's certainly uh, very little I could add um, to to what you you just um, spoke to regarding the, the the current status of the conflict. When when I was uh, reading this conflict um, uh, or this question, Chris, one of the questions that came to my mind was uh, maybe we should ask also which conflict. Um, because what you had just uh, addressed, John, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's, those are the facts on the ground, and that certainly, uh, certainly uh, makes great good sense. I would add to that um, the hybrid uh, warfare and the, uh, the, the hybrid threats and the asymmetric warfare that are also simultaneously going, uh, being conducted, uh, along with the more conventional things um, that John just uh, laid out. One of the uh, uh, here and again we have to, we have to go back to uh, 2014 and look at the the uh, annexation of Crimea and the the movement into the eastern portion of of Ukraine and how that and and then that movement into Syria and then if you'll remember uh, <clears throat> the movement of Syrian refugees into uh, uh, Europe. And the stress that that placed on uh, the, the uh, European Union in in 2015, and so this really began then this this uh, this use of of migrants uh, or, re- or weaponizing migrants and refugees, and so uh, the the goal then was if we could get all if, if Russia could get these these migrants and refugees all moving toward Europe and stress the infrastructure of Europe. Uh, Putin, who was not militarily strong enough to, to to take on NATO, could could actually press the EU and NATO to to, to collapse by through this weaponization. We saw that same uh, similar activity uh, along the Polish border and uh, Belarus when Russia was bringing in refugees uh, uh, and migrants and and putting them uh, on the border in Belarus and and pushing them toward Poland. So this hybrid threat of using uh, refugees and migrants to destabilize um, uh, sovereign states is is part of this war, this much broader uh, war that is going on. So we see the conventional fight uh, right before our eyes in Ukraine. And I I say, uh, possibly we need to open the aperture a little bit and and see the, 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 this geopolitical shift that's going on right now within the context of uh, Russia wanting to reestablish itself as an empire. So that, that's the one uh, example of, of uh, using migrants and, and refugees or weaponizing them. And this goes back to the, uh, the Gerizimov doctrine within, within Russia uh, to use uh, unconventional hybrid threats uh, out there. The other is, is, the, is the asymmetric warfare that, that continues to go on. Um, one of the things we we look at is uh, cyber-enabled information warfare as part of that asymmetric war, uh, fight, and recognizing that um, Russia, in many places, is winning the information war, and uh, that Russia, in in many places in the world, is still seen as the champion of the oppressed, and U.S. is still seen as imperialistic, and so. This this uh, this part of that war is also going on, and and what we see then is Russia playing this long game to divide Europe and under undermine European support for Ukraine. So this all then becomes uh, part of that ongoing asymmetric conflict warfare and uh, and, and and using hybrid threats to stress the infrastructure uh, of the um, of of the states and. Primarily NATO. That would be the happiest thing that could for Putin would be a NATO collapse, and that he is successful in separating uh, 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 the European NATO countries. You know, the tri- that, that he that he severs the transatlantic 
relationship uh, between the United States um, and Europe. That's a great point there that you made. I wanted to piggyback on that. It's one of the ultimate ironies of the Russian invasion of Ukraine is that so many of President Putin's goals have been completely reversed. He has been his own worst enemy. He has had this fear of NATO expansion, which in a vacuum makes sense. If you go back to the early 90s, the collapse of the Soviet Union, throughout the 90s, there were several agreements made that NATO would not, not, might not, would not expand eastward into uh, the former Soviet Union, NATO did. Um, when you look at nation states like Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, those were in the heart of the Soviet Union. Now they're in NATO. Um, so in an effort to prevent this possibly fictitious invasion of NATO forces into Russian spheres of influence, he has actually encouraged more nation states to possibly join NATO. The possibility of Ukraine joining NATO, I still look at that as a very, very long shot but he literally made it more of a possibility. So it's shocking how so many of President Putin's goals, or at least his stated goals, uh, have actually reversed uh, after invading Ukraine. He united the Europeans and the United States. It's important to note, if you look at domestic politics, the Trump administration may have been one of the most anti-NATO administrations in American history. I don't know why I said may have been, was one of the more anti NATO forces. Again, this America first um, movement by the Trump administration, uh, by definition, means America first and a desire to spend less on NATO. Vladimir Putin took NATO at one of its weakest points and literally made it stronger than it has ever been. So again, the mistakes by President Putin are extraordinary in this case. And we can address some of those later also. But great yeah. points. Yeah, no, if I if could, because I, I really do uh, want to underline what, what, what you just pointed out, John, and I, and also wanted to to add to that. So, if, if, um, just highlight or add to it, and that was going back again to 2014, and 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 uh, the the issue being that that Putin had, if we remember that, is he he was upset. He was cons- it, it, what, what got him all riled up was that that Ukraine wanted to work, become part of the uh, European Union and not part of the Russian Economic Union. And so, uh, as, uh, yeah, I agree with you that, that NATO is certainly a factor in all of this. And I also uh, highlight as part of, you know, comma, and the economic piece as well, because that that was really the, gen, uh, that's what really pushed that first domino over in 2014. Was it was uh, uh, was it Yanukovych? I, I'm, I'm I'm blanking on the the uh, uh, president at the time of Ukraine. Um, said no. Nah, uh, he kind of was he was playing a deal, right? He's kind of leaning toward Russia, and then at the last minute said, Ah, no, no, no. I mean, I want to go with the European Union, uh, and uh, that that then caused the the, the uh, Maidan. Uh, so forth and so on, and and I and I would also add to that, as you as you pointed out, John, that another concern that Putin has and has always had is its its fear of the color revolutions, and he, mm-hmm. he saw that happening mm-hmm. um, with that with that uh, shift toward the EU, not necessarily NATO, but shift uh, toward the EU. Yeah, NATO was coming. I mean, that was obvious, but but it was the the economic shift to the EU that also caused him a great deal of concern. Great, thanks. Um, excuse me. Um, so a couple things before we uh, move on to the next question. First thing is I appreciate the uh, observations and uh, questions in the chat, and we'll try to get to some of those later on. Um, uh, also, if you have questions, feel free to to ask them in chat. We we're, we're more than welcome to take those um, as well. Um, so uh, let me go ahead and actually uh, take up a question from the chat, um, which is. Uh, Kind of a more straightforward one. Um, so uh, Rowan asks, I believe I pronounced that correctly. Um, uh, how did Russia lose its flagship? I saw. Is that a reference <laughs> to the Black Sea Fleet? The I believe so. The the Moscow, I think it was. Yeah. 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 There. Are, and Tom, I don't know if you wanted to jump on that first. No, no. Go ahead, please. You're. you're uh, yeah. That, by all means. That is yet another, as far as we know. Because uh, understandably, we do not have um, CNN embedded reporters uh, throughout the region as we did in Iraq. 
Uh, that is a great example. It's like a little microcosm of what we thought was a strong military, conventional military by the Russians, and incredible underestimation of Ukrainian resolve. I believe, as far as we know, that was a relatively, not real, a very old uh, missile system that was Ukrainian, not U.S. Uh, I think two were launched. I think there were multiple mistakes made by the Russian sailors, as far as we know, because again, I believe every Russian sailor involved died. Um, the flagship of the Russian military, or the Russian uh, Black Sea Navy is at the bottom of the Black Sea. It was an extraordinary underestimation of Ukrainian military skill and an overestimation of Russian conventional military uh, techniques. It was, it was something that should not have happened. If you were to fire um, decades old, anti, I don't even think, I think it was specifically anti-ship, but if you fire decades old anti-ship missiles, two of them, at say the USS Ronald Reagan, they're not getting through. There are multiple redundancies in place uh, to protect US aircraft carriers. And yet this did get through to the Russians. So how did they lose their the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet? I had, uh, underestimation of Ukrainian military skill and overestimation of Russian skill, uh, a breakdown in simple defense strategies for the protection of all military forces at sea. This is just another example of the Russian military proving itself to be exponentially less effective than we thought they were before this invasion. I'll leave it at that, and there might be other details to add in. Great question. Yeah, no, no, um, you no, know, you're, you're you're absolutely correct. And what it what it does point to is the the vulnerability of um, of um, of systems. And and one thing I, I as you're talking, John, made, made me immediately think. You know, the British uh, when they went to uh, to Argentina uh, lost a, lost a high tech missile missile ship. I think to a little Exocet missile that you know a couple of guys on a Zodiac raft shot at it. Um, so yes, uh, some of these, these, uh, these larger, you know, I, I, Russians have already lost a thousand tanks. I mean, so, uh, you know, tank ships, these are, these, uh, these become just big targets. Um, and, and, a, and a couple of, a couple of guys and gals, as I said, with a, with a, you know, a raft full of, full of TNT can put a big hole in the side of a ship. And we saw that uh, in, in the Middle East with one of our vessels. Uh, so, yeah. Great point. And again, not to insinuate that U.S. naval forces are magic. It's tactics. Uh, yeah. The, the yeah. U.S. would never lose an aircraft carrier in the Black Sea, no. mainly because no. I can't imagine a scenario in which a U.S. aircraft carrier would be in the Black Sea. That is yeah. a sea. Yeah. It's not an ocean. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the main reasons aircraft carriers in the U.S. Navy are so impossible uh, to destroy if anyone ever tried is because they would not be in an area that's easy to attack and if a yeah. long-range weapon system is sent they're fast it's really yeah. hard to hit something in the middle of the pacific or atlantic or indian ocean being in the black sea is a disadvantage and as you mentioned we have had uh, a u.s destroyer the uh, the uss cole was yeah. attacked by basically um i don't want to say um uh, the equivalent of a bass yeah. boat or a pontoon boat, but kind yeah. of some guys on a raft, basically. Yeah. And 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 yeah. we learn from that. We've uh, adopted yeah. changes in strategy. But again, how the flagship of the Russian Navy was possibly uh, destroyed by such an inferior force? Number one, it's not an inferior force, and number two, the Russian military is not what we thought it was, and they yeah. are proving that daily. This yeah. is not yeah. to insinuate any insults to the Russian military. It's just a fact. Yeah, yeah. This this was this was one of the dangers of ever employing your your forces mm -hmm. uh, is that your adversary <laughs> gets to to make a realistic assessment. Uh, exactly. We had for a good long time, good long while, and I, I I speak from being in the Cold War as well. You know, we we looked at the Russians as being ten feet tall, um, and then when when we we met them, no, <laughs> they are not, and they are proving that again. That they they are not ten feet tall. They're they are uh, they are being beaten daily um, uh, by people. Uh, that go, it also goes to show that it, that it's not weapons that wins wars. It's it's people, and the fighting spirit of of, of the Ukrainian soldiers, the Ukrainian citizens, the civil military um, uh, interaction of these two groups is is holding the the Russians off. 
Great, thanks. So, um, getting back to uh, something that Tom was talking about earlier about the use of uh, refugees and things like that, um, uh, potentially as a destabilizing force, but also, I mean, you know, th those people are also people that are likely to be, you know, suffering as a result of the conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, are there, um, I mean, obviously beyond those groups as well, you know, what, what groups are likely to be suffering uh, as a result of the conflict and, um, you know, um, it, what is the, um, um, well, well, what are their prospects, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. Um, is there any prospect of that changing? Yeah, yeah, I, um, that's a, that's a, that's a great, a great question. And uh, one thing I'd like to highlight too, is when, when we talk about um, hybrid threats, too, it, it, it's, it's not necessarily as though uh, Russia is saying, well, I'm going to go to Syria and push all these refugees into Europe. But when I see it happening, I ask, how can I leverage that to my benefit? How could I, I do that? And so, yes, uh, uh, these people are, in fact, uh, suffering, being uprooted, taken away from their homes, whether it was in Syria or now in uh, in Ukraine, um, and 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 you you one would have to ask, well, I what what's the return? <laughs> what's the return policy here? Will these people come back? Is this going to be a long term brain drain? Is this going to be uh, uh, what, what will Ukraine look like? Uh, what will what will the end of this look like? Um, uh, if there is an end, or will it be just a perpetual uh, ongoing uh, ongoing conflict? Um, so I think the we're, we're we're in a position today where we really have to look at, and I, I know NATO is looking at uh, protection of civilians along with um, uh, civilian harm mitigation, uh, because civilians are caught up in the middle of all this and finding themselves being weaponized. Um, simply by their movements, uh, by their, their, their pushing against structures. So no, it's not as though it's an intentional activity, but it's one that's being capitalized on and leveraged uh, by, by, uh, by uh, the adversary. So yes, the, the, I think the suffering, long, I hate to be pessimistic, but uh, I, I don't see uh, much end to that to that suffering. And the other question we have to ask ourselves, and I know it's it's further down on the list of questions that, that were out there, is how long um, can this alliance be held together? How long uh, before these, uh, these stresses on the infrastructure of the different states causes um, uh, people to relook the, the strength of their commitment uh, to, to Ukraine? And as we said, you know, and then couple that with energy. I mean, uh, Ukraine has already today uh, stopped exporting uh, electricity uh, to try and reestablish its energy. Uh, would then we couple that with oil and gas uh, that, that's that's flowing at at, at, sm at lesser rates? And um, yeah, I think the the pain is going to to spread uh, long before it gets any better. Great point, Sarah. You hit the, the the major elements. Civilian populations in this situation are extremely vulnerable, vulnerable due to Russian military strategy. The indiscriminate bombing of municipal areas is something that President Putin has long since shown is not something he's willing to accept. It's something he is very quick to go to if losing. Um, mm -hmm. Women, children, uh, uh, always uh, disproportionately impacted by military uh, mm -hmm. conflicts like this. I would point out that considering if you're looking at areas that are geographically controlled by Russia, the LGBT community would be disproportionately impacted. Russian domestic policy does not recognize um, LGBT rights as we do here mm -hmm. in the United States. Uh, that's a community that is overwhelmingly oppressed in Russia. So any areas mm -hmm. they take over would also be in danger. But great uh, summary there. The Russian strategy, Russian military tactics present a situation where anyone who's a civilian uh, has the possible has the possibility of suffering disproportionately. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the, uh, the 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 numbers I I've seen now are ninety ten um, civilian to uh, military 
the, this conflict writ large. So to, to look at the impact on civilians in, of warfare today, the numbers that they were looking at is there are 90 civilian deaths of every 10 um, military deaths in, in, uh, in modern conflict. So what we see is, is yes, that the civilian population is disproportionately impacted and, and, and harmed uh, by this. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so getting to something that you, we've all been kind of dancing around here, which is uh, miscalculation, right? Um, <laughs> why, why, why do you think Putin apparently miscalculated in his belief that Ukraine would quickly capitulate uh, to his demands? And I guess more broadly, I, I don't think it's just Putin. I mean, you know, we, we were talking about this earlier with, uh, I think you were, uh, Tom was mentioning Milley's estimates, right, at the beginning of the war. Um, we miscalculated. The West miscalculated. Mm -hmm. The world miscalculated. I think everybody except possibly <laughs> right. the Ukrainian leadership yeah. miscalculated. Um you know, why do we fail to pre uh, predict the magnitude of Ukraine's ability and willingness to resist? Great question there. Um, to start off with U.S. Uh, predictions that were so wrong, it's Russia. When the United States is trying to predict the military capability of Russia, we are at a disadvantage. If the U.S. Defense Department were to make estimates about the U.K. or France or Australia or Japan, where we have uh, extraordinary military alliances with. We can make accurate assumptions. With Russia, there's a great deal we have to take from the Kremlin, and they have overestimated military capabilities on many occasions, obviously. That's one of the major reasons for that. In terms of Vladimir Putin, there are a lot of reasons. I would argue that the number one source for miscalculation for President Putin, thinking this would be a war that ended in a matter of days, with the capitulation of all of Ukraine, the uh, the summary execution of the democratically elected government and Ukraine basically being brought in as a puppet state has a lot to do with the fact that there are disadvantages to being an authoritarian. There are disadvantages to being a totalitarian military dictator. Not that that's technically what Putin is, but kind of that's what Putin is. When you are an authoritarian regime, when you have backslid from liberal democracy through illiberal democracy back to authoritarianism as Russia has, the disadvantages are that you tend to surround yourself with political sycophants who will tell you whatever you want to hear. There isn't a great deal of bad news that is normally brought to President Putin. So as is the case with many tyrants, it's hard to find people that you can surround yourself that will speak truth to power. As a result, it's understandable that you might think your military is a little bit more capable than it actually is. is there, you might find yourself and advisors are constantly telling you the Ukrainians will collapse. Ukraine wants to be a part of Russia. It's easy to be wrong. The advantages to liberal democracy are found in the fact that we do argue. We do have multiple parties. We do have transparent government systems. We have institutions in place that have centuries of experience, not necessarily lying to power, but telling truth to it. So a lot of reasons why Putin would misunderstand this. Beyond that, you have the past. What happened in 2014 after Russia annexed Crimea? What did the U.S. do? What did the what did NATO do? What did the European Union do? Not much. Were sanctions put in place? Yes. Um, were expensive, um, sophisticated weapon systems sent in? No. He had literal history right there saying this is what happened when I took the Crimean Peninsula. Maybe that's what will happen when I invade Ukraine. Um, the outright invasion of Ukraine by Putin turned out to be similar uh, to the Nazi invasion of Poland to the UK and to France, just a bridge too far. So he had experience with NATO not necessarily doing anything when he took pieces of Ukraine. He had a relatively successful um, support of pro-Russian separatists in the Donbass that continued to exist. There was a there was a strong belief that the West was not united enough to stand up to Putin. Uh, there were also the years of the Trump administration again, neither here nor there, neither positive nor negative, just the fact the Trump administration and its America first policy led Putin to think America's not that interested in going toe to toe with the Russian juggernaut. Um, 
these are some of the major reasons I would look to for why Putin underestimated Ukrainian resistance. And that's because as tyrants before him have always or tended to do, he didn't have access to the most accurate data. Anything unattractive might not have been brought to President Putin. And when he says, I think we're going to take Ukraine quickly and efficiently and without much trouble, a lot of people around him said, sure, of course we will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, a a a absolutely. And, and what I what I would add to that, you know, maybe sidestep around here a little bit. I, when, when thinking about Russia, um, I'm, I've, I've always uh, come back to Winston Churchill's observation that uh, that Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Mm -hmm. And that really, uh, Chris, to your point, you know, how did we not see this? How did we not, you know, we have the best um, intelligence gathering apparatus. Uh, we've got you know, we've got everything, you know, right? Why didn't we, why didn't we see this, uh, this train wreck coming and, and, and do something, I mean, for him? And I agree with everything John just said about the lack of pushback, the, the, the sanctions that, that yeah, they were, yes, yeah, sanction, sanctions at best have a very mixed uh, track record uh, of, of whether or not they influence uh, behavior of others. But what, what I, what I do find um, interesting is that I think all we needed to do was believe what Putin said. He, 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 just, just, he didn't hide any of this. None of this was, he didn't, this was not like in a mystery to, to any of this. He, the, his Munich speech was very, very clear. The Munich Security Conference, he was very clear about his intentions. He, and he told the world that. Um, and and then in his June speech, I mean, was that like two hours long? He just, he laid the whole thing out. It, you know, he said, "This is this is what I'm going to do," and and um, it it makes me think of Hitler. I mean, Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. I mean, he wrote he, he published it here. You, you know, whatever. But Bin Laden, this is what I'm going to do. And consistently, we we fail to listen to what we're being told. And again, and then we we struggle to try and understand how did we get blindsided like this? How did we not see this coming? Um, and I think I think a part of it is we just don't pay attention to to the uh, what what, uh, what what we're being told. Um, you know, why did Putin go too far? Uh, you know, Roman backer and Joanna Rack uh, started did some interesting work here, and I think one of the one of the pieces is a faulty decision making. And for all the reasons you you had mentioned, John, and I would add to that, uh, they they uh, imperial superiority syndrome. That's what uh, Russia and Putin were suffering from, uh, along with colonial thinking syndrome. And uh, these two these two really influenced the, the, what was already a faulty decision making system because uh, Russia is a corrupt system. And interestingly enough about that, when we when we say, OK, what does it mean by a corrupt system? The, the, the struggle there is we can only know pieces of that corrupt system. We, we can't we can never see the whole corrupt Russia system. We only get to see bits and pieces of it. So we don't see just exactly how all these uh, these pieces fit together. But one thing we do know, and that is that Putin is the keystone. In uh, when it comes to social, political, economic, and military, so it's not so necessary. It's not such a. And I, I'll maybe talk about this a little bit later on if we have time. So it's it's not so much that well, you know, Putin is the guy. It's that Putin is the keystone, um, and and if he's removed, we can expect to see another keystone put in there. Uh, uh, we don't we don't necessarily expect to see the collapse of of the system. Another thing that I, I would highlight about, you know, how did he, how did he go too far? How did he mess this up? Is all Russian political thought in the first decade of the 21st century has been imperial. So if if we go back and look at the academic side, the scholarship side, we look at all that uh, for the entire 21st century, first decade of this century, it's all been uh, focused on on imperialism. Um, the other issue too is I think. That, that before the invasion, Putin had made a lot of demands on NATO, but now, not on Ukraine. The, the, the demands were on NATO. And I think this speaks to that part where 
Putin's ultimate goal is to, to sever the transatlantic alliance and, uh, and to, because it, it, in his mind, it, the, it's the U.S. that is, is the issue. I mean, he, he wants to, it's us, that, the U.S. that's the goal to, to sever us and keep us out, uh, out of NATO and out of, out of Europe. Um, the, the other is that, again, starting in, in 2010, so in first, te- first decade of this century, it's all about imperialistic thinking. But in, in starting in 2010, uh, if, you, if we look at Putin's speeches, all of them included a piece on Russian war potential. And I think this goes to your point uh, earlier, John, that, that it surpasses all other power. And so when, when we see this imperial superiority syndrome begin to develop, in this in the in this century, the first part of this century, we see now <clears throat> that the scholarship, the theory, you know, the history of, of imperial Russia is is reemerging, and then we begin to see in the second decade, uh, every one of Putin's speeches talk about the power of the military, strongest thing uh, that Russia has, and now we we begin to see all the pieces being set in motion um, for this. Um, this reemergence of an imperial Russia. Um, but the other part of that is to be an imperial power, <laughs> you have to have, uh, you've got to be strong militarily and, and territorially. And so uh, Ukraine becomes the first, the first domino to push over. And this is why other countries such as uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, um, you know, um, the whole Eastern flank uh, uh, begins to, to look at this and wonder, are, are we next? Because again, if you have those imperial designs, you have to have somebody to be an emperor over. And, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, the one thing I, I was kind of thinking about as you were talking about it was, you know, the, the lack of information at the center being kind of a common theme in Russian and Soviet history. Um, you know, I'm thinking back to you know, central planning under the Soviet Union, right, mm-hmm. where, you know, you had these quotas that were supposed to be fulfilled by, you know, the regional factories and things like this, and the people in Moscow really didn't know what was really going on in the factories, right? You know, there, there was all this accounting fraud, there was all this uh, manufacturing <laughs> of stuff that didn't work, and... Another five-year you know, plan. We, <laughs> and then when we look at the military that... Russia has today, you see kind of the same thing, right? But on paper, you have this very strong military that is full of people that are, you know, basically selling the gas out of their tanks to civilians to right. to feed themselves, right? Right. And uh, you know, how, I guess the question is how, uh, and not, you know, how, how does the, and maybe it's as simple as you know, nobody is willing to tell the boss that this is going on, right? But. But I mean, you, in any organization, right, there's that fear of, OK, the boss is not going to want to hear bad news. Why is it so pronounced in a place like Russia as opposed to, you know, the United States? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, is, you know, is it you would think that there would be a limit to how much authoritarianism can stop information from getting to the top, but apparently there isn't. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I did to your point, Chris, too, I, you know, part of that, just the corruption's baked in to the whole darn system, everything. And so, you know, to your, to your point, nobody's telling the truth and everybody knows, no, <laughs> they all know nobody's telling the truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and that makes the decision-making incredibly challenging <laughs> when, uh, because everybody, everybody in the system knows it's corrupt, and this was, you know, as your point, with you know Stalin and one five-year plan after another, uh, you know the the. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm with you. There's nobody there to tell the emperor he has no clothes on, um, and and if there was, they'd say he's lying anyway. Mm-hmm. So, so. And that I think it's important to note the 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 assumption of Putin that the United States and NATO would do nothing would not do or not do what we have done or would respond in the same way we did with the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. To think, to go back just a year ago before this invasion, to imagine the U.S. sending in the, for example, like the HIMARS long-range artillery weapon systems to Ukraine would be unthinkable. Uh, To think of the number of anti-tank weapon systems that have been sent in by the U.S., by Germany, by NATO forces would have been unthinkable. 
to this day, sending in, say, F-16s or F-15s is still unthinkable. But the overwhelming push of the line of what was considered acceptable for NATO and U.S. forces to send in to help Ukraine, I think, was the biggest surprise. I think that if President Putin, go back in time, knowing what the U.S. and the NATO military response would be in terms of aid to Ukraine, I don't think he invades. It's impossible to truly get across how embarrassing this has been for the Russian military. No one looks at the Russian military as a near peer of the U.S. anymore. There's the United States, there's China. That is not to take away from Russian forces if they were to be invaded themselves. I am not saying that Russia is now something that you can just conquer, nor am I saying you should ever want to do that. Uh, But it's really hard to underestimate the catastrophic, catastrophic embarrassment that this has been. Ukraine is across a border, one border, and the Russians have proved him incapable of maintaining logistics, maintaining fuel in their vehicles. Um, the corruption that you see, purchasing extraordinarily cheap tires for a multi-million dollar tank that, or uh, tanks for weapon systems that should operate but don't. This has been a catastrophic failure for the Russians. The embarrassments just continue to add up. I don't mm-hmm. can't imagine Putin recognizing this as the possibility of it happening and ever actually invading. I think Putin is stuck now and looking mm-hmm. for that magical off ramp, uh, whatever mm-hmm. it may be. But again, mm-hmm. can't stress enough. NATO yeah. response to this invasion has really not taking away from the bravery and the overwhelming skill of the Ukrainians, uh, but the NATO aid has dramatically shifted this equation in a way that I don't think Putin expected at the outset. I think he thought mm-hmm. NATO response to Crimea 2.0. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah. I, um, before we move on, I think that, you know, one thing that I'm kind of thinking of is mm, Putin overplaying his hand in the sense of, I mean, I think that what you're saying about about the West not responding, I think there's a good possibility that had he just mildly escalated the war, mm-hmm. um, you know, set into essentially gone to what is now Plan B, right? Um, you know, take over more of the East, take over, more, build that land bridge to Crimea. Maybe he doesn't get that response from the the West, right? But you know, the direct, uh, essentially the assault on Kiev or Kiev, right? You know, and wanting to decapitate a, a sovereign state, I think is is the bridge too far right um because that um because it allowed people in you know places like lithuania and finland and in you know and romania would to say okay well this could happen to us right mm-hmm. whereas you know if it, if it just meant okay we're going to expand the donbass right if we're, we're just going mm-hmm. to expand the control of um, you know, the territory to, you know, what what the Luxembourg Republic claims it controls, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure people in, um, you know, Lithuania are going to be losing as much sleep about that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which is ultimately what puts the pressure on, on NATO and the U.S. to respond, right, is that you've got those frontline countries that are saying, okay, you know, uh, Putin comes after us next. Now, maybe that's just speculation on my part. Maybe it's Maybe the tripwire was just escalation in general, but um, to me, that just seems like that was the sort of okay. This is a this is a line that we can't allow somebody to cross, right? Because if you know, if he can go go in and basically take over a neighboring country, then what stops you know either him doing it again or what what stops China from doing this in? Mm-hmm. Taiwan or some other country that or Mongolia or something, right? Um, I, I think that's the, you know, that's the miscalculation to me um, mm-hmm. more than anything else. Um, and also, of course, he probably has a more sustainable war if he doesn't try to, you know, start this, you know, new front through, um, you know, in, in through uh, Belarus, right? Um, but that's a that's a different question, I guess. Um, so at this point of the conflict, right, people have talked a lot about exit strategies and off ramps and things like that, obviously some of which is, um, maybe, you know, about saving face for Putin, um, which begs the question first, you know, 
what what are the off ramps? Is there an exit strategy? And uh, I guess the other question is: Is there now the Ukrainians are almost emboldened? Is there a compromise they're willing to live with? Right? Are, are you know is it return to the two thousand? Is it return to the sovereign borders or bust for the <clears throat> Ukrainians at this point? Right? Um, or you know, I mean, can can Zelensky settle for less than the two thousand fourteen borders? Politically, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, now that his, his military has shown that they can do things, right? Um, you know, does that mean reconquest of Crimea or uh, the war is not over? Or, you know, what is the, what can Putin settle for that also Zelensky can settle for? I don't know. What, what, is that the empty set? Mm-hmm. <laughs> John, do you want to jump? Uh, and that's the billion dollar question. How 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 could this end? I think for the Ukrainians and uh, President Zelensky has actually said this um, pre-2014. Uh, the Ukrainians have provided they're still getting NATO support. Uh, they have proved themselves more than capable of preventing the Russian military from militarily dominating and subjugating Ukraine. So uh, I think for the Ukrainians, they're going to want the, all of the Donbass back. They're going to want the Crimean Peninsula back. They're going to want assurances that Russia uh, does not invade ever again. I think they have definitely gone past that point, um, provided they're still getting NATO support. And who can blame them? They're winning. Uh, they're taking on what was considered to be one of the most powerful militaries on the planet, and they are embarrassing them on a day-to-day basis. Having said that, for Putin, that's the even better question, because who knows? Uh, I don't necessarily think that Putin has an exit strategy that would go much farther than the Soviet war in Afghanistan. I think this will continue on and get more and more and more painful, more and more and more Russian uh, civilians will have dead sons and uncles and fathers coming back to the point that it does cause a demand for some kind of a regime change, possibly. This could end in the Kremlin with a bullet to the back of the head of President Putin. Having said that, if President Putin went somewhere in between, I think he would look at maintaining the Donbass region, looking at maintaining what he had before and a chunk of eastern Ukraine. These are the possible exit strategies. And then there's the devastating possibility of one exit strategy involving escalation and the use of uh, tactical nuclear weapons, which I do not see happening militarily. That would make so little sense for Russia to actually do that. I'm hoping that's not uh, a possible exit strategy. So while answering the question without really answering the question, for the Ukrainians, I think the exit, the, the end of this war is a unified Ukraine pre-2014. Uh, for President Putin, I have no idea. I would have gone the route of trying to mainly achieve what we gained in the eastern Ukrainian regions and then try to sue for peace. Uh, but I think for President Putin, the unfortunate reality might be that there really is no exit strategy beyond perpetual war. Um, and however that ends, it ends. I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Tom. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. Um, I'm just making a quick note because I I think you you hit it. And, and this is looking at, at, uh, at Ukraine and Russia in a broader context. And so it is... Uh, a, talked before, I think, uh, in, in an earlier uh, webinar, where we talked about the, the we, we've sort of set, we've sort of entered into an age of perpetual conflict. And so, but we're stuck oftentimes looking uh, for conclusions that look like, you know, signing a peace treaty on the USS Missouri or, or you know, that there, there's been some kind of negotiated conclusion uh, to this. And then there's a, a date we can put on the calendar every year and say this was when the war ended. I'm, I don't think that's going to be the case here. I don't think we're going to see um, a conclusion. I think we're going to see we're, we're going to see an ongoing conflict without conclusion. And um, what that's going to look like, I don't know. I mean, because what we, we have uh, we are now really looking at uh, shifts in in warfare. This is a, a tectonic shift <laughs> that we're right in the middle of. And we're trying to make sense of it, uh, and and that's that's frustrating us um, because we would like to impose a, a rational actor model onto this and look at do a cost benefit analysis and predict 
uh, what the outcome is going to be. The only thing I'm absolutely certain of is the outcome will be dictated by Ukraine. What, what, whatever this outcome is, they will get to decide what it is. And I do take uh, uh, Zelensky at his word. He said this war started in Crimea and it will end in Crimea. And I, I, I believe him there. What I would also add to this is also, uh, as we're talking about Ukraine and Russia and the conflict before us, is again, looking at it in a, in a broader sense and looking at it as, as a world war. Arguably, uh, uh, we look at, at World War II, we look at the conflict in Ukraine being the biggest military engagement in Europe since World War II. And one of the things we, that, that's being argued is this war in Ukraine is actually a, a bigger world war than World War II was. Um, as we look at, at grain, as we look at fuel, oil, gas, energy. Uh, so we're, we're seeing the impacts of what's happening in, uh, in Ukraine, Russia, spread out all around the world. Um, and, and, the, and the chances that what's happening in, uh, between Ukraine and, and, and Russia will destabilize huge portions of the world. Um, if we think back to um, uh, the Arab Spring, and, and the idea that one of the catalysts of, Arabs, of, of, of uh, the Arab Spring was a lack of grain coming into to the Middle East. And that really was one of the things that, that pushed uh, a lot of, that, uh, a lot of that, that fight. Timothy Snyder did, uh, did some interesting talk, uh, work on this. And one of the things that he would suggest is that this war will establish the principles of the 21st century. And again, looking at it in this context of a much broader world war and, and the, the challenges that we now face ourselves, uh, ourselves is not just how will the, 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 the hostilities in Ukraine cease, but what new principles uh, of interstate relations will, will emerge from this. Um, and so that that's that, that really makes it, this fight look incredibly uh, incredibly um, um, important. The uh, other thing is, you know, uh, Putin's in, in a position now. When we talk about um, you know exit strategy, he he can't be backed into a corner, and and that's I think uh, something we have to remind ourselves because if Russia loses the war, um, he'll just claim that they won it. And and the creative fiction will be believed, uh, just as as Chris had mentioned about the five year plans and the you know and the and just the absolute corruption of the system. You know, people will just say, okay, yeah, we won. Uh, so so Putin's kind of in a, in a really interesting position because he 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 can't uh, can't really lose. He can't be backed into that corner because uh, I said we're talking about uh, Mikhail Bakhtin said that you know Russians live inside of a lie. And and Putin is a master at, it. and what, but one of the things I did pick up uh, this morning that I thought was interesting was uh, uh, Dana Massacott at Rand Corporation uh, was talking about how um, the, this failing uh, war has actually strengthened the far right uh, critics of Putin because we we tend to a, a lot of us tend to look at Putin as you know he's the I mentioned he's the keystone and so we kind of want to personify this and say well you know uh, Putin's the guy but we forget that there's there there are far right critics of Putin right now and that the that this failing war um is 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 pushing these hardline hawks to favor sharp military escalation so they're, you know, the off ramp. We're looking for the off ramp. They're they're looking. How do we escalate this? Uh, because, and, and Putin's in a position now that if he doesn't escalate, he, he's he's not threatened by the peaceniks in Russia. The threat is from the far right critics. So he now has to has to actually escalate the conflict to uh, keep his position in in uh, in in Russia. So his options are really, really shrinking. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the, the most viable option he has is to escalate, to maintain his position within, within Russia itself. Um, so that's, again, not to be a, a pessimist, but um, that, 
that 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 causes me concern, especially uh, when people start rattling the the the, the nuclear saber. Uh, yeah, I guess the the other question related to that would be, you know, if, if Putin escalates or if this continues, right? Um, do other states start to take advantage of Russia's weakness, right? I mean, you've already seen that to some extent in what's going on in Armenia and Azerbaijan, right? Uh, um, you know, the Azerbaijan yeah. has basically, um, you know, pressed its uh, conflict with Armenia. Um, mm -hmm. Do the Georgians go after South Ossetia? Do um, do the Kazakhs, you know, make a play for you know more uh, in into you know into Siberia, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, where, uh, <clears throat> you know, in, I mean, theoretically, and, and Russia's a big country, right? So they've got to defend all these borders, but at the same time, they've also got to go on offense in, I mean, I don't think it's likely that right. Finland's going to try to reclaim <laughs> St. <laughs> Petersburg or anything, right. but at the same time, right, yeah. um, there are all possibilities that Putin has to sort of keep in mind there, right? And um, so... And I, you know, at the same time, you're talking about escalating, right? I mean, that almost opens the door for, okay, well, why why don't the Moldovians just retake uh, Transnistria, right? Or, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, yeah. what, what's Putin going to do about it at this point, right? He can't yeah. really move troops through Ukraine to stop them. Um, right. I guess the only question is, you know, at least with the Moldovans, right, you would assume that somebody would try to be holding them back because um, they want to, you know, play nice with the EU. But, um but I don't, I'm not sure that the Georgians or the Ar Armenians or the Azerbaijanis or whoever, um, you know, have such compunctions, right? Um, you know, all these frozen conflicts from the last century, right, are just mm -hmm. basically out there still. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I, that that's one of the problems that, I mean, never resolving sort of the breakup of the Russian Empire sort of created, right? You know, mm -hmm. The Soviets sort of froze all that in place, but... Yeah. Um, right. you know, um, in any event, um, so, uh, we did have a question from the chat, uh, about, um, sanctions and their effect on the Russian economy. You know, how, how much is, are, are these sanctions, um, and, uh, the, the knockout effects of the, of the conflict, um, going to set back their economy? Um, you know, are we talking years? Are we talking centuries yeah well what what, what is yeah. the um you know um I mean, we've alluded to that already in terms of the uh the mm -hmm. shortages of supplies and manpower and things like that um you know it probably gotta get worse before it gets better um so um but but what is the magnitude of that likely to be on a country that already is not um you know at the at the forefront economically um mm -hmm. as is I would go the decades route. The, the, the brain drain that is occurring throughout Russia is something that I, I don't know if we have the uh, the mechanisms to measure it right now. This is something we will see over time. This will lead to Russia being reduced to an even weaker state than they were before. We just thought they were stronger. Um, if you have the ability, unless you are one of those hardline, uh, extremely right wing Russians that are that's just yearning uh, for the days of empire and the Soviet Union, if you have the ability, the money and the, the, the possibility, you've probably left Russia already. Uh, the people who are leaving Russia are generally those with financial resources, with advanced degrees. You're losing your engineers. You're losing your medical professionals. The, the long-term effects of these sanctions are just, I think, you know, unimaginable to, uh, to really measure right now, but we will see over time. And I think that President Putin could not possibly care less. All politics are truly local. He is maintaining his own power structure. The decisions that he have made that he's making still are just economically suicidal. Having said that, um, it's important to remember that nothing against the people of Russia, and there are over 140 million people there. If you look at uh, GDP, for example, they're not in the top 10. They're just outside. But there are American states, California, Texas, and almost Florida that have a higher GDP than Russia. We need to really remind ourselves that this what Putin wanted us to think of as this terrifying and powerful Russian presence is not that powerful. And they've proved that time and time again. Um, if you look at the military, their spending is south of $70 billion. The U.S. military spending in 2021 was in the vicinity of $800 billion. Russia, 
long term, the sanctions, uh, the brain drain, the loss of resources because of these sanctions is going to emerge militarily and economically exponentially weaker than they already were. The only major difference is this time we will know how weak they are without nuclear weapons, which Russia has a great deal of. Again, even there, we do not know how many they how many warheads they have that are uh, actually maintained properly and capable. I would not want to ever test that. But without nuclear weapons, we look at Russia the same way we look at nation states like Iran. I don't mean to say that in a way that takes away from the possible danger of Russian nuclear escalation. I think long term, the sanctions and the war itself are going to provide us with a very accurate view of Russia as an exponentially weaker nation state than we thought they were. Everything Putin wants, he is going to get the opposite of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I just quick was was jotting down some some notes to myself, and I appreciate that that uh, that question. I think you know in in no particular order. Yeah, sanctions. Um, yeah, just a mixed bag there. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm not really certain that sanctions really change uh, change behavior, and quite often sanctions have a, a disproportionate negative impact on the the weakest parts of society anyway. So it's really not not addressing the, the um, for lack of a better term, elites. So mm -hmm. when I look at sanctions, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't think they really do much. And it takes so long for them to take effect uh, as well. It, it, it takes years for sanctions to really um, uh, get hold of, uh, of an economy. Now, that said, uh, before before Putin did this, before uh, Putin set the, this uh, this war into motion, you know he he had brought a lot of gold out of Africa, uh, mining interests that Russia have in Africa. Um, you know, so there's money that was set aside um, uh, as well before this even happened, and he's he's making a bundle of money now uh, on oil exports and and oil prices as well. So. You know, are what are who are are these sanctions having any any impact? I, I'm I'm always very pessimistic that 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 they do. One thing I, I would want to uh, say, um, too, is that, and this goes with 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 sanctions. It's that Russians have a history of suffering, um, and that being part of of a of a. A national character, for lack of a better word, you know that suffering is not unknown to the Russians, and that that's part of of, of Putin's narrative as well. And to, as you mentioned earlier, John, talking about NATO's moving uh, eastward and it's threatening uh, us, you know, th this feeds in then to Putin say, "See, I told you, here they come. The the West is coming after us, uh, militarily and economically. Like I've always said, they're they're coming after us in Mother Russia." And that 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 animates an, a patriotism within Russia, because, again, history matters and they know their history. And and so and the other part it does, too, I think, is it speaks to the urban rural divide in Russia. You know, as you mentioned, John, with 40 million people across 11 time zones, uh, you know, and in and, and the, the, the number I read this morning, it said approximately 700,000 uh, males. Uh, have uh, escaped Russia to avoid conscription. Se 700,000 out of 40 million. I mean, you know, we look at that 700,000 and say, oh my gosh, it's a, you know, that's a, oh my, it's a, the system's going to collapse. Russia's going to go belly up. No, <laughs> it's 700,000 out of 40 million. Uh, do, it, it, we just need to do the math there. The other part too is, yes, as you mentioned, rightfully so, I believe, you know, those elites who had the capacity to leave are leaving. And you're, you're talking about a brain drain and this and the other thing, and they're going. But that leaves the rural who have this immense pride in Russia, suffering, you know, uh, 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 the peasant in Russia is revered. I mean, even throughout Russian literature, whether it's Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or, you know, uh, any of them, it's the peasant who sees things clearly. These elites don't, don't get it. They, they're, they're blinded 
you know, but we trust the, the, the peasant. So I think um, a lot of this, too, when we do sanctions and we, and we do a lot of this, is feeding into that narrative that's strengthening, not necessarily weakening uh, that character and that resolve of, of the Russian. Maybe this is wrong. Right. I, I mean, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I, that's, yeah. you know. I'm reading. glad you made that point. I, um, when you're looking at, granted, the, the 140 million Russians is, a, is a population wise a large nation state. Yeah, I'm sorry, 140 million. I don't know why I said 40 oh, no. million. I, I did not mean, I'm glad you mentioned the, the yeah. inability of sanctions to do really much of anything by themselves. I, I'm referencing more of the war itself, the atrocities yeah. of the war and the, the geopolitical ramifications yeah. of the war. And, yeah. and when it comes, when you look at Russia right now and they are getting military tech from Iran, they are looking into North Korea, they are looking at, yeah. at soldiers from Syria. If these are the three predominant sources of military aid that Russia can look to for help, A, they're in trouble, and B, I think that's where these sanctions might have an effect. Yeah. The, the inability of bringing in microprocessors and computer chips that go into complex sure. weapon systems, I think they're running low on incredibly sophisticated weapons. And yep. they're not able to restock. But you are right. Sanctions by themselves have a horrible history yeah. of yeah. gaining the, the results that you want. Yeah. However, fighting an incredibly unjust uh, war of choice over time, I think that's going to really turn Russia into an exponentially weaker nation state yeah. than they were yeah. coming into this. So I think it's going to yeah. be devastating. Yeah. What, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. I, no, no, no argument whatsoever, John. I think you know, spot on, spot on target. What, what I would add to that, and say, it's at least worth looking at, or at least taking a glance at, and that is uh, Russia's status across Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as I mentioned, you know, still many, mm -hmm. as you said, uh, uh, many people, many countries, many others see Russia as, as um, you know, fighting the oppressor, mm -hmm. fighting the imperialistic U.S. Um, you know, and so uh, some of them are, are hedging their bets, <laughs> you know, and, and they're looking at this and saying, yeah, a war, of, war of choice. Yeah, but it's a European war. Mm -hmm. And but here us in Europe, you know, in Africa, we, we've got our interests, too. And uh, Russia standing up again, uh, mm -hmm. standing up to to the imperialistic West, which they mean U.S. And. Uh, yeah, so we're kind of we'll sit back and see how yeah. this plays out because uh, there there's gonna be there's still gonna be a Russia tomorrow mm -hmm. no matter what happens. That's a great point, and I said there's an actual huge advantage of that. I think that's why you're not gonna see President Putin go the disastrous route of escalating the nuclear weapons. I think once he right. makes that decision, yeah. he loses yeah. China. He he loses the yeah. silence of India. He loses yeah. those days. It'll be impossible to gain support. But yeah. if he does that. God help us all. Who knows what he, that he would, no, he no, so. he no longer is fighting the oppressor then. Exactly. You know, and and so yeah, he's he's got to maintain that that uh, that image, which then is you, you yes, you have a pile of bad actors, and you mentioned mm. all the North Korea, Iran, and all uh, on, on, feeding into him. But then you have these other marginal actors throughout Africa that are kind of um, uh, trying to how they, find out how they can how they can protect their interests mm -hmm. uh, to see how this falls out. Yeah, I agree completely. Okay, great. Well, um, I had a couple more questions, but we've arrived at 6.30, and it seems like a good point for us to uh, uh, adjourn. Um, but um, uh, maybe we'll have time to ask those questions at another event. I, I didn't say... Based on what we talked about today, it doesn't sound like the Ukraine conflict is going to come to a close anytime soon. So, um, so we'll probably be back here in uh, February or or March um, and discussing this again. Um, but um, anyway, I'd like to thank um, our audience for joining us this evening. A little bit light today, but I don't know. Uh, hopefully, we can. Hopefully, hopefully that doesn't reflect fatigue with the conflict or uh, lack of interest in international politics, at least. Um, maybe just a timing thing. I don't know. Uh, maybe we're up against some important event. Um, uh, let's see. But uh, also, I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. John Hall and Dr. Thomas Matrock. I'd like to thank um, all of you for joining us. Um, and um, let's see. We uh, are planning one more event for this semester. We'll have don't have the um, uh, details in front of me, but I believe we're going to be uh, discussing the outcome of the uh, <clears throat>
2022 gubernatorial and midterm elections uh, on the um, Monday after the election, which I think is the um, 14th of uh, November. Um, that's if I'm not mistaken. Um, so in about I think it's just about four weeks from today, because uh, today is our first day of early voting, by the way. So go on ahead and uh, take advantage of that over the next three weeks if you uh, want to beat the crowds. Um, and uh, let's see. So, um, so that'll be our final event of the semester. Um, so hopefully you can join us for that. Uh, of course, you can find more about our department and things like that on our website at www.mga.edu slash political science um, with a dash somewhere in there. Um, and then um, we will also uh, be posting a video, this video, uh, as well as our past discussion videos on our uh, YouTube page. Like I said, that will probably be posted sometime tomorrow, so keep an eye out for that. And uh, thank you all again for joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your afternoon and evening, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at our uh, next event. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Y'all have a great thank evening. You.